infrastructures of the entire world. The COVID-19 pandemic is the biggest public health challenge that the world has faced in recent memory. While countries all over the world ponder over the economic outfall of this massive outbreak at a large scale, the socio-economic concerns for the grassroots level workers are hard to ignore. The global impact of COVID can be classified into three large groups, human suffering, severe global recession, and soaring unemployment due to financial and corporate sector hardships. Given the way it has hurt both public and private sector businesses, created rapid aversion among the investors and placed all major financial bodies under stress. The world is on track to bear witness to a global regression, the likes of which we have not witnessed since World War II. The World Bank has called this epidemic a perfect storm for the South Asian region and has estimated mm. that the regional growth for South Asia alone will fall to a range between 1.8 to 2.8% in 2020, down from 6.3% projected six months ago. In this regard, it is hard to overestimate the role of migrant labor in the Gulf, where jobs in construction, sanitation, and transportation are primarily undertaken by millions of workers, primarily from the South Asian region. In the wake of the ongoing coronavirus pandemic, millions of migrant workers in the Gulf countries have been dismissed. For a country, with a population of over 200 million, Pakistan's capital is an extremely valuable resource, particularly when over 60% of its human capital comprises of the youth. Insufficient employment opportunities and familial burdens have led a major portion of our youth to travel abroad to seek better economic opportunities. This sizable workforce consists of laborers who contribute immensely to our remittances as well as highly philanthropic and generous Pakistanis who give back to their country. For Pakistan, remittances alone make up about 86% of the secondary income balance of the economy, out of which nearly 60% of these are from the Gulf countries. According to the government of Pakistan uh, figures, about 90% 90, 90 of the stranded Pakistanis are concentrated in the United Arab Emirates, in Saudi Arabia, and Qatar. In the recent crisis, the government has done a commendable job in repatriating our overseas Pakistanis. According to the plan initiated in late March by the National Coordination Committee on COVID, stepwise repatriation is being carried out. The coronavirus pandemic raises exceptional health and livelihood challenges for the millions of Pakistanis working in the Gulf, as well as for the communities that rely on them. Not only will their return impact Pakistan's economy, in the form of drastic, a major drop in remittances annually, but it will also affect the thousands of dependents uh, that rely on these incomes. Now, the return of infected workers and the fear of a fresh outbreak is also an ongoing challenge for concerned authorities and healthcare facilities. Just to give you an example of the scale of the threat, on May 2nd, 190 out of 400 183 passengers who were brought to Karachi through special flights from Dubai, Sharjah, and Colombo, as well as an additional 105 passengers that were repatriated from the UAE to Pakistan on the 4th of May, all tested positive. Now, bringing back our people in these times of adversity requires unprecedented dedication and vision, which has been demonstrated by the Prime Minister, that is Imran Khan who has always raised his voice for the rights of overseas workers long before this outbreak had begun. He has called them a national asset, and our testament of them should be befitting of that. In this regard, it will be important to keep coordinating with countries in the Gulf, as well as the Middle East, for securing better conditions for our people working there once we overcome this challenge. In this regard, the center, that is the Center for Middle East, East in Africa at the ISSI has organized this webinar with the purpose to create discourse, to generate concrete suggestions and recommendations to deal with this ongoing challenge. Now, with these introductory remarks, it gives me great pleasure to invite Ambassador Ezaz Ahmed Chaudhry, the Director General of the Institute for Strategic Studies, who has served as Pakistan's Foreign Secretary, as well as Pakistan's Ambassador to the United States, for his welcome remarks. Ambassador Chaudhry. Thank you. Thank you, Amina. This was uh, uh, a good 
roundup that you gave about the uh, topic that we are about to discuss. But let me first uh, welcome uh, this galaxy of uh, my compatriots, Muid Yusuf, Special Assistant to uh, the Prime Minister, uh, a man of uh, ideas, a man of uh, great commitment and integrity and innovation. And I'm glad that uh, the present government has engaged him for uh, this and many other important tasks that you will be performing. Welcome uh, uh, to this program, um, with, uh, it's good to, to have you with us. Uh, I'm also pleased uh, to have a representative from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Salman Atha, who is heading Crisis uh, Management Center, uh, which uh, before the program started, he mentioned has been functioning uh, for uh, for about two to three months and doing a good job. And of course, everybody else who is joining in, uh, Kashif Nusa, uh, who is the Director General for Emigration and uh, Overseas Pakistanis, uh, Amir Sheikh Saab, Managing Director of uh, Overseas Pakistanis. By the way, uh, for three years, I was a member of the Board of Governors of OPF uh, when I was Foreign Secretary. Uh, because I thought that this organization has great potential of doing a good job. And Senator Sahar Kamran, uh, most welcome. She has lived and worked in Saudi Arabia for long years, and now she's running a center here and is contributing to that debate for the welfare of our Pakistani brothers and sisters, particularly those living in the Gulf, as well as the strategic picture. So very warm welcome, ma'am, to, uh, to the program. Um, and of course, and last but not the least, there's um, Asif Durrani, Ambassador Asif Durrani. Uh, uh, he was, his last appointment was in United Arab Emirates, which at the moment is in the news. And therefore, it, it would be fantastic to have his inputs. And, and he's also now a part of a think tank, IPRI. Uh, so good to have you with us. Uh, a very warm welcome to all of you. Um, the subject has been introduced by Amna. I think uh, this is, uh, why have we chosen this subject? It's important for us to, uh, uh, to know that uh, this institute, which uh, is sponsored by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, takes pride in picking theaters of government to enhance, to uh, to multiply the narratives that our government is building. And therefore, we have been, uh, lately we uh, did a program on debt relief initiative of the Prime Minister. And of course, we highlighted the other day role of Pakistan's UN, UN peacekeepers. Then we celebrated Yom Taqbeer and so on. And this particular activity that the government of Pakistan is currently engaged in is also very close to the hearts of the people of Pakistan. And we thought that we being the research arm of the foreign ministry must also contribute to this debate to enhance the awareness uh, amongst the people of Pakistan as well as outside that uh, the government of Pakistan cares for its people, uh, whether at home or abroad. And that, that's the basic sense uh, for a motivation for us to, to be doing this program. Of course, as Amina said, and as you will hear from the keynote speaker, you will hear from Arhama, who, is, who will be preparing the, uh, who has prepared a presentation for you. I too uh, would only say that there are two kinds of challenges. One is the immediate challenge, which you are already grappling with now, uh, um, uh, and the other is medium to long-term challenges. Um, as uh, Ashraf was saying, uh, the first job is to get people back. Uh, they are stranded, and they have lost jobs, they have lost livelihoods, they are living in cramped places amidst COVID-19, and that's why many of them, when they land here, they are suffering from that virus. So, uh, first to get them back, and I must say that I talk to my colleagues in the embassies all the time, there's a very positive feedback. Uh, our embassies are doing a phenomenal work on this, uh, by, guided by all of you in Islamabad, but I am very pleased that they are working uh, on it as a, as a national commitment. But once they come back here, then again, your job is not that easy. That would be medium to long-term challenges, providing them uh, 
again you know health security economic security in these uncertain times uh, when there is oil glut i am not sure how uh, soon those people will be able to go back to their jobs um, remittances would be down so that would uh, means uh, mean revenue shortfalls um, and there will be psychological pressures too uh, you will all talk about this therefore i would refrain from going into uh, into those details at this time my job is to uh, warmly welcome you to this webinar and i hope that once you have all spoken we will prepare um, reports we will circulate as widely as possible uh, the main points that you will make in your presentations uh, and share it with the government but also with the international community because we are now expanding our outreach through social media and elsewhere uh, so that our messaging goes where it must go with that uh, warm welcome to you all back to you amina thank you so much so let's begin with uh, our first presentation that is by arhama sadika who's a research fellow at the center for middle east and africa at the institute of strategic studies arhama mm, assalam alaikum and good morning i'll be giving a brief overview of the impact on the pakistan economy as amina has mentioned the current pandemic raises structural challenges uh, and health and livelihood challenges for the millions of pakistanis working in the country the immediate impact is that the migrant workers returning home could become carriers of the virus despite the safety measures that are being taken in april sources from saudi arabia and qatar as mentioned already uh, it is stated that more than half of the covid cases were found in foreigners residing in residential zones and a large number of passengers on the flights arriving from the uae tested positive hence needless to say consequences could be detrimental if the virus goes uncontrolled now trend of the short term impacts now there are two short term impacts primarily uh, whether the home country benefits from returning immigrants depends on the immigrant success in accumulating savings as well as on the home country's ability to make use of the returning skills and investment that said a majority of the pakistani workers returning from abroad do not have much savings since they send back money on a monthly basis shifting saving is a one time measure so from the very next month the effects of the foreign remittances will be highly visible already remittances fell from 1.894 billion dollars in march to 1.79 billion dollars in april then we turn to the reintegration of workers in light of the virus strict curfews have been imposed on daily functioning of the economy in this scenario a huge influx of unemployed workers causes anxiety and even in some cases resentment both from within existing circles and those coming in this could have negative implications for society hence the integration of these workers is very crucial now for the long term impacts uh, as mentioned already for pakistan remittances make up a significant part of pakistan's secondary income official sources anticipate that remittances will decrease by 1 to 1.5 billion dollars per year if the situation persists which could also mean that around 10,000 to 11,000 households will be directly affected moreover before the pandemic around 60,000 people were in the process of applying abroad for jobs of these 20,000 pakistani workers were in the process of entering saudi arabia the current recession and global price of oil and its continuation of all tourist projects in the gulf countries is an added cause for alarm since it means that they won't be importing workers for the time being the imf has already estimated the unemployment rate projection projection for pakistan to be 6.2% for this year which brings me to my next point unemployment has a high correlation with country's crime rate already there are reports that the crime rate in punjab has increased significantly in the backdrop of the curfews furthermore persistence of high rates of unemployment can lead to a drop in Rate and a subsequent rise in domestic violence as well. A few recommendations: It is important that the government engage with foreign, uh, with their foreign counterparts to first check for the virus in all the passengers who are meant to fly out, and second, in the event that they do test positive, they should be facilitated in the country where they are present. There should be policies in place that encourage returnees' investment and labour market reintegration, including. the expansion of insurance policies number 3 the government should ensure minimum job for lost overseas pakistanis 
so that people who have already cleared the application process can still be provided for in the future. A proper database needs to be established for the immigrants returning to Pakistan so that their families can also be easily provided for. Number four, the government and relevant departments could should encourage cottage industries. These already make up 80% of our employment in Pakistan. However, it is the mid-most sector of the Pakistan economy. Hence, there should be sound policies as well as secure financial and legal environment to stimulate investment in other capital employees. And my final point is that even though COVID has halted major projects in Kalt, once activities resume, there will be a demand for labor force. In this case, the government should ensure that proper training is provided to the civil labor force to make them more competitive, and there should also be a plan for mitigating the worst threats to migrant workers, worker rights, and improving the status throughout the Gulf. Thank you, and over to Amla. Thank you so much. Apologies for the disturbance. We're having a little work done at the Institute. Um, now, our keynote speaker for today is Dr. Moeed Yusuf, who is a special assistant to the Prime Minister on National Security Division and Strategic Policy. He is also the chairperson of the Strategic Policy Planning Cell, which functions under the National Security Division. Prior to this, he served as an associate vice president of the Asia Center at the U.S. Institute for Peace in Washington, D.C. Dr. Yusuf, you have the floor. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear you. We can hear you. Please start. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Azhar Sahib and um, ISSI. Um, first thing I've noticed is I need to get my official title change. It's too long. Um, but let me um, sort of begin by saying that this is a task that I was handed over at the National uh, Command and Operational Center. And a lot of people have asked me, what does a, why does a national security um, advisor or assistant uh, look at repatriation of Pakistanis? So let me just begin there. And I begin there to explain to you how we've handled COVID as a government. The National Command and Operational Center is set up under the National a coordination committee, which is chaired by the prime minister. And the NCOC's principal task is coordination. So what has happened is that there are various ministries doing various things. So in the repatriation space, you've got, of course, the aviation ministry uh, division. You've got the foreign ministry. Um, you've got the overseas ministry. The question is, how do you coordinate everybody? Because right now we don't have the luxury of time. We've got to make decisions on the basis of not even daily, but hourly basis. So the NCOC, what it's done is it's put people in charge of particular issues. Somebody's looking at, um, I'm looking at repatriation. Somebody's looking at hospitals. Somebody else is looking at uh, compliance with the standard operating procedures, etc. And so my task, and the reason I become the face of this policy, is that I'm coordinating these various elements of the state and bringing them together. So that's to, to start off. Now, what were the marching orders from the prime minister? Fundamentally, I think you've also mentioned in your introduction, the prime minister is very, very um, sensitive to the needs of overseas Pakistanis. He's championed their cause. He rightly feels that they actually support, they're the mainstay of Pakistan's economy, but also of Pakistan's image abroad. Uh, as Asa would bail me out, that uh, his job as ambassador around the world uh, would have been impossible without the support of Pakistani community, wherever these ambassadors are, uh, our ambassadors are. So, you know, in that sense, they are critical to us. The challenge quite frankly for us was that we were dealing with a near impossible situation because we had to bring back Pakistanis, which is their right. So it's not a favor that the government is doing on them by bringing them back. It is actually they who are doing a favor on us by being very patient, very, very accommodating as they've, some of them have waited for weeks now. So I must thank them and they've really shown 
what the character of our nation is at the end of the day. When there is a crisis, we bring our uh, best to the table. And we've seen that every day. Uh, I can promise you, um, you know, that we've had occasions where I couldn't help but have literally have tears in my eyes. Those kind of situations have come. But we've also made it a point, uh, myself, the foreign minister, the aviation minister, overseas minister, we've literally been taking calls at 2 a.m. Uh, because this is our responsibility. So I want to be clear that we are not doing anybody a favor. This is their uh, responsibility. The problem was we had to bring people back as safely as possible. So it was very easy for us and very popular for us to say, okay, we are just going to open airspace and bring everybody back. That wasn't possible because you will remember that initially this virus came to Pakistan from the air and the land border outside Pakistan. So the Iran border, unfortunately, because of the situation in Qom and uh, some of our travelers on flights. The opposite reality, the contrast was that we did not get a single COVID patient from China, despite the fact that Wuhan was the start and the epicenter for a few weeks in the beginning because we worked with the Chinese government. They were very, very cooperative. We closed the borders and we prevented that from happening. So the policy understanding at the time was, we have no testing capacity to speak of. We have no way to judge whether people coming in are positive. And so the only prudent option we had was to close down the airspace, which we did, uh, I believe on the 21st of March, and then reassess and very quickly build up our capacity to test people, to screen people, to quarantine people. This was a very unpopular decision. Our overseas, um, uh, especially our labor that was being laid off by the dozens or being sent on leave, actually that's the largest number, who were being forced to go on leave for a while and they had to come back because of course they don't have the resources to survive. So what did we do? And I, I must confess before I say that, this policy must not have looked coherent from the outside. So I must confess this. And the reason was we had made up our mind to do two things throughout. Number one, be as transparent as possible. So rather than looking good, we wanted to give as much information to everybody to show what our compulsions were. And you know that this disease, we were learning more about this disease and the world was learning new things about this disease every day. So the second thing we decided was we were going to be data driven. We will not make arbitrary decisions. We will not make subjective calls. So the NCOC has a whole committee looking at this issue that I chair. We have the overseas minister there. We have the foreign office there. We have every ministry and agency that you require. And how did we set this up? Here was the process. And all of this, by the way, and all numbers, all flight schedules are available on our website, covid.gov.pk, because we want it to be transparent. The foreign ministry and the overseas ministry sit together and decide a weekly schedule. Where will we send planes? Who will come from where? And our ambassadors on ground in these countries are in charge of deciding who will get priority to sit on the plane. People register with embassies and then the stranded people, according to a set criteria on our website, are decided for every plane. Second, we at the NCOC work with the health facilities and the provinces, because ultimately it's the provinces that have to test and quarantine people. And with this consensus, we create strategies for every week. So we, we started off and there was a lot of criticism on the 17th, I believe, of March, or maybe 16th of March, we brought in a policy that anybody coming into Pakistan will need a test done from the point of origin. A lot of people complain that we can't get tests done. That is true. At that time, it was very difficult. Even today, it's very difficult. But you can look around, you will find multiple countries in the world now asking for tests. The reason at that time was that we wanted to give people 72 hours or so to try and come back if they wanted with tests. And if they couldn't, then we were going to block the airspace on the 21st of March, which we did. 
From there on, we've increased our numbers. First, we brought back people who were stuck at airports. Then we went to about 2,000 a week in Islamabad only. We tested from the 4th of April to the 11th of April. Then we went to about 5,000. And now, till last week, we were able to bring 1,000 people a day. This week, from the 1st of June and the 10th of June, we are bringing 20,000 people. So 2,000 people a week. So we've gone from no traffic to about 500 a week, to 2,000, to 5,000, to about 7,000, to now about 1,000, uh, 2,000 a day. So about 14,000 uh, a week. So that's how we've increased. But the problem is we've got about 100,000 stranded outside still waiting. And about 100,000 more who are students who we did not count in the first category because usually they have more ability to sustain themselves who also need to come back. So even this strategy is not sustainable. So why have we brought so few people? And this is an important point, and then I'll just bring this together to tell you what we are doing in the future. We had two constraints. Our health experts decided that everybody who will come in will have to be tested because we don't know where the hotspots are. So uh, Madam, you in your introduction um, explained that, oh, from UAE, there have been some positives, et cetera. By the way, there was no plane uh, definitely not from Colombo and not from UAE where everybody was positive. So that's not correct. Uh, I'll give you the numbers. But um, basically, that's how we determine where the hotspots may be, where people who are coming in may be positive and he, who we need to deal with differently. Second, when we were testing people, we were holding them till the test results came. As testing in the country grew, we went from about 450 tests in mid-March to about 17, 18,000, I think, now every day. The domestic test pressure kept rising because our first priority was to test people within Pakistan so that the disease didn't spread. As we started doing that, the pressures on the laboratories increased and the time we were taking to bring test results back for the passengers increased. So we had to keep passengers in quarantine for three to four days before we would send them home. This meant that our total number that was coming in from abroad kept, uh, was limited because we only have so much testing and so much quarantine facility in every province. That was the bottleneck. So where are we now? As of yesterday, we have eliminated the requirement of keeping people in quarantine. Sorry, day before yesterday, on the second. We will test people and we will let them go home. Then once the results come, we will track them and trace them and the positives will be either treated or sent into home quarantine, strict home quarantine, and the negatives would also have to complete home quarantine for 14 days. Why didn't we do this on the first day? Why didn't it? Because if we did this, we could have brought in an unlimited number. We didn't do this because we did not have our track and trace process in place. So it's taken us about six weeks, eight weeks to create a proper software-based track and trace system. So what I'm trying to explain to you is there was a logic behind every painful decision we took. And today we are ready, Alhamdulillah. And within 10 days or so, I can tell you, we are moving to a completely new policy through which we will be able to bring unlimited number of passengers. So almost like pre-corona times, but it's not complete yet, so let me not say more on that. The point is we now have our testing in place. We have our track and trace in place. We don't need to quarantine people. They can go home and get quarantined. Only the symptomatic will be quarantined and treated. That way, the overseas Pakistanis will be able to come back in large, large numbers. Final point I want to make. I told you that we are data-driven. Almost every day we spend time looking at where are the uh, positives coming from? Where are the negatives uh, that, where there's no problem? How many passengers can we bring in? Why can't we provide predictability? So passengers rightly want to know flight schedules for the next four weeks. And I explained to you that because we have to look at things every day, we must keep flexibility to change flights, to block flights, to allow flights. Remember, majority of the world was closed. So every flight we fly, we have to take permissions from the other airports and countries to allow us to fly special flights. 
people have also complained that we have given PIA monopoly profits. What I want to explain to you is that the reason we have only flown PIA is not because it's monopoly profits. Aviation industry fares are going to go up, period, because we are um, uh, uh, implementing social distancing. So a plane cannot carry more than a certain amount of people. So that's the chain that's going to happen around the world. The reason we have given PIA majority of the flights is that we can control their schedules, their numbers, their destinations. We can't ask Qatar Airways and British Airways and everybody else to fly here and don't fly there. They have their schedules. Only PIA, the national carrier, we can request to fly special flights everywhere. That's what we did. Final thing I wanted to tell you was that the, num the reason for opening up airspace, because there's a genuine concern people have, oh, the disease is spreading in Pakistan, we know that. And here you are, you are now opening the floodgates of overseas Pakistanis. So this is going to mix and you're going to have an explosion in terms of the disease. The answer to that is very important. Pakistan's disease was 100% from overseas when we started off. So it made sense to block people from coming back. Today, 92 to 93% of the disease is local transmission. So it makes absolutely no sense to stop people from coming home when the disease spread from them is less than 6 to 7% in the overall scheme of things. And within that 6 to 7%, 95% are already caught at testing facilities or through tracking systems. So you have almost negligible spread, actually virtually zero from overseas Pakistanis now. So it's a completely different environment. That is why we are opening up. It's not that we are being callous about it. Uh, and that's why we're bringing people back. Also, please keep in mind, when 200,000 people outside are struggling, it's our responsibility to bring them back. This is not a favor we are doing them. They are Pakistanis. It's their right to come back to their country. And that has been the direction of the Prime Minister directly. Sorry, I said final point, but let me just say one thing and then I'll thank you. This effort will continue for a while. The reason we have been successful is that all institutions are coordinating and on the same page. And for everybody sitting here who served in the Pakistan government, let me tell you. I at least have never seen this kind of coordination as NCOC has achieved, civil, military, within civil, etc. But this problem is going to continue, unfortunately, for a while, and I'll tell you why. The disease is spreading in Pakistan, so I can guarantee you the pressure will remain to try and moderate the inflow. But we are beginning to see another problem, and I've not told this to anybody, so let me say it here. Um, if Pakistan's numbers are high of passengers who are traveling outside, outbound flights, which we've opened up completely, and there are a large number of positives that are going from Pakistan abroad, other countries are beginning to say the same thing we are saying about countries from where a lot of positives came into Pakistan. So the next phase of this problem to deal with is we have to look at issues of positives traveling abroad because we don't want Pakistan to be labeled a high-risk country and for other countries to prevent Pakistanis from coming. So the next phase, inshallah, in another 10 days, we will allow unlimited inbound traffic. So the next phase we have to deal with is outbound traffic. So this problem will continue for a while, but let me assure you, we are working day and night, 24-7 for the return of overseas Pakistanis in the safest possible manner. And let me end by once again thanking our overseas Pakistanis who have waited very patiently, who've cooperated with us, and our priority remains our strategic labor. The elite of this country has been very upset. Many have actually complained to me, to many others, because unfortunately, in the society, we think that we are something. Sorry. I think maybe it's your phone. The dis the disruption is coming from your side. The other. Sorry, I'm I'm just finishing. I'm just saying 
that I am proud of the fact that the direction I had from my boss, the prime minister, and what we have executed is we are going to bring stranded people back. If people with money, people with connections are going to be upset, so be it. We have a national responsibility and that's how we're fulfilling it. I understand it's not a neat policy. Many have suffered. I, I must apologize, but I must thank them as well. This is probably the best that any country could have done under the circumstances. Uh, and so thank you for your, for your attention and time. I'm sorry we've gone on too long, but I did want to explain that we've done this with a very clear rationale behind it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> so our next speaker is Mr. Kashif Ahmed Noor, who is the Director General, Bureau of Immigration and Overseas Pakistanis. He has held this position since 2016. Among other positions held, he has previously been the Chief Executive Officer, uh, Primaco, and Director General Audit, Foreign and International Office of the Audit General of Pakistan. Um, with these uh, introductory remarks for Dr. Kashif Noor, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Amina. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, Honorable Muid Yusuf Saab, Honorable Senator Saher Kamran Sahiba, my ex boss, Azaz Chaudhary Saab, Ambassador Khalid Mahmood, Ambassador Rasif Durani, all the distinguished colleagues. Asalaamu Alaikum. As Muid Yusuf Saab very correctly pointed out, yes, we have a case in hand and we have an issue at hand to deal with. Uh, Arama, can you move the uh, first slide, please? These are just few numbers which I would like to share with this distinguished gathering. The first category is those people who were registered for employment abroad and could not travel due to the COVID-19 incidents. It's about 60,000 and we don't think that they'll likely, uh, they're likely to travel in near future. Then there was another 100,000 plus recruitment at various stages uh, of the demands. And we do not think that they'll be fulfilled in at least 2020. The layoffs, which we have currently estimated has crossed the 35,000 figure. In fact, this, uh, when I submitted the presentation was about 15th of May. Today, the figure has crossed the 40,000 mark and I'm not counting the numbers of people who are on paid or unpaid leave. If I just give you two more numbers, one is the numbers uh, in the first three months of 2020, 177,000 people went abroad for uh, work. But since then, in April and May, only 55 people, please compare 177,000 to 55 only, have gone abroad. The remittances, alhamdulillah, till April have not been affected, but we are fearing the first effect when the figures of May come out in a few days. In fact, the uh, remittances till April were higher than the corresponding period last year. So this is just to set the stage for the uh, magnitude of crisis which we are looking at, at least 100,000 people out, 100,000 families, which we have to cater for as of now. And we apprehend that uh, the numbers which we are seeing of India and uh, Bangladesh are much higher than ours. So we apprehend that the figure is going to be much higher. Right now, as Mohit Yusuf Saab said, that we are concentrating on return as well as planning for the reintegration phase. Um, Arama, can you put in the next slide, please? <clears throat> the return included foreign missions. They've played an excellent part. They register people, they get them the tickets, get them the flights, and then those guys come back home. FIA has the immigration data. The district administration helps in quarantine, as Mohit Yusuf said. This is the return phase. The uh, proposal that my organization has submitted to the Ministry of Overseas Pakistanis is for the reintegration phase, which we believe should be launched in near future. We have prepared 
to get uh, the data, we have started gathering data from foreign missions and we are linked with FIA so that we can have the data customized and filtered to build the candidate's profile or uh, if he wants to go abroad again in future, we are collaborating with NAF TTC to have the skills certified. And if need be, as was pointed out by Arham, that the skills upgraded so that he can have a better employment in future if he wants to go abroad or work in Pakistan. We're We'll be sharing this data with NAFTTC for national job market, as well as with SMEDA and uh, the youth uh, program of Usman Darsab, so that to have some small scale entrepreneurship set up for these guys who are coming back and who've got some sort of uh, money and experience. And if he wants to set up some entrepreneur entrepreneurship in Pakistan, he can be facilitated for that. We also are mindful of the fact that there'll be claims associated of dues, of financial assistance, of guys who are coming back. OPF, or sister organization, is going to look into that. And if there are some complaints with reference to the employment, my, my organization will deal with the same. There's a very important aspect of social inclusion and social reintegration of the returnees. As I submitted that NYDF has some provision for loans for entrepreneurship. We have shared first set of data with BISP because we believe that BISP is the first window when it comes to the reintegration through its SAS cash transfer and SAS school fee programs, which are currently running. A few uh, months ago, when the data from BISP came out and some uh, passport holders were excluded, we have requested uh, Madam Sanya Nishtar to reconsider the passport holder clause because a lot of workers who are coming back may fulfill the criteria of NSE. Just made that passport to go abroad to have a job and not for going uh, on some sort of excursion or visit. There's another pro proposal which is currently in consideration in our ministry is to have an uh, pen for overseas Pakistanis as well as informal labor registry at EOBI. EOBI, again, a sister organization in our ministry, is currently only uh, dealing with pensions of workers in Pakistan. We have submitted a case to them, and uh, my organization as well as OPF is currently pursuing with them to have some sort of a pension facility for our overseas labor as well as immigrant migrant workers so that when they come back after putting x number of years they should have some sort of pension or some fund to look forward to if they want to settle back home in a peaceful way these are the uh, steps which we have submitted to the ministry and i believe that uh, uh, honorable bukhari sahab has shared them with uh, honorable Muid yusuf sahab as well and i believe that if we all sit together, work, we can reintegrate those Pakistanis who are coming back due to this COVID situation in a much better way. And they won't be putting any uh, burden on the economy and as well as on the resources, and they'll be able to play their part in a much better way. Uh, with these few words, I would like to thank again, and I will be more than happy to uh, answer any questions as far as uh, my presentation is concerned or our role in the overseas ministry or in Bureau of Immigration is concerned. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Salman Atar, who is the Director General, Crisis Management Unit, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He has been with the Pakistan's uh, Foreign Service since 2002. Previously, he had been posted in Abu Dhabi, Singapore, and Muscat, um, to name a few. 
Um, Mr. Atif, the floor is yours. Please uh, unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, excellencies, uh, as my colleagues have already discussed about the implications of this uh, great crisis, uh, I will not, uh, I mean, touch upon this uh, issue. But I, what I can do is to shed light on the contribution of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, with special reference to the CMU, as well as the contribution of our embassies across the world uh, in uh, repatriation of stranded Pakistanis, with special reference to the, those missions which are situated in Gulf countries. As we are all aware that the world is passing through very unusual times and an unprecedented crisis, and the, as we are also aware that the dynamics of earlier pandemics were different from the present one. And when the WHO declared COVID-19 as a pandemic in March uh, this year, nobody could guess what will be our future and what will be the gravity of this uh, 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 pandemic, this crisis. And uh, unfortunately, throughout the world, no one was ready to fight with this pandemic. But uh, and uh, as the situation is uh, the situation is uh, unfolding, yet we cannot precisely predict what will be our future. And uh, uh, in March, when the countries of the world started restricting flight operations, Foreign Office was quick enough to guess the gravity of the impending crisis. Therefore, uh, it was the initiative of the Foreign Minister to establish a crisis management unit in the Ministry of the Foreign Affairs, which can coordinate with the missions, as well as with other ministries, as well as it can provide information to the people who are living in uh, foreign countries, as well as who are living in Pakistan, and whose relatives are living abroad, and who are very concerned about the well-being of their relatives. Uh, earlier, whenever there was a crisis, uh, crisis management cells were created, but soon after the crisis finished, they were dismantled. But this time, foreign minister wanted to have a permanent setup, which can have permanent record, and which can, uh, uh, I mean, the people st keep on coming and going, but the unit is uh, there. So uh, I will come, uh, uh, I will briefly describe the establishment, uh, the functions of the CMU. The function of the CMU include coordination with the missions to provide information to the missions. If missions want some information from other ministries, they can call us and they can contact us. We can uh, reach the other ministries and we provide information to those uh, uh, missions. Secondly, if other ministries want any information about the strand in Pakistanis, we also provide information to them. And thirdly, uh, we maintain the list of stranded Pakistanis, which we take from our missions on a regular basis and will provide them to other stakeholders, for example, uh, National Security Division, OPF, Overseas Pakistanis Division, etc. Et uh, now I will come to the uh, contribution of Pakistan missions abroad. When this crisis in evolved, uh, there were curfews and lockdowns across the world. So it was very difficult for our missions to get information, but I will uh, just commend their uh, efforts in this regard. Despite difficulties and constraints of finance, as well as manpower, they have done a wonderful job. Uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs also provided finances to our missions abroad to help those people who, who are uh, stranded abroad and who do not have, uh, I mean, much uh, finances to meet their daily needs. So at present, an amount of around 900,000 US dollars have been spent out of PCW uh, to help those Pakistanis who are destitute uh, or who do not have enough money to uh, meet their daily needs. So far, we have uh, repatriated 51,000, more than 51,000 Pakistanis from abroad, which include 47,000 through flights, 
and remaining through land borders. What our missions are doing, they are maintaining that list of uh, stranded Pakistanis and in coordination with PIA, they are facilitating the repatriation process. So whenever there is any flight, they provide the list of stranded Pakistanis who have to be repatriated through those flights to PIA and then those Pakistanis are repatriated. At present, we have around 92,000 Pakistanis who are stranded abroad, out of whom only 5,569 are in other countries and the remaining are in three countries, including UAE, more than 54,000, Qatar, around 2,000, and Saudi Arabia, which are which is the number where the number is around 31,000. So I will again reiterate that despite difficulties, our missions are doing a wonderful job. And at the headquarters, CMU, as well as all our territorial uh, divisions, they are also, uh, we are also in touch and we, CMU is working 24 by seven. We are, uh, we have also established a helpline. We provide information to the people of the community who are uh, uh, living abroad and who are clueless because, you know, our missions, uh, they have very limited manpower. So it's very difficult for our missions to attend uh, to everybody. So in, in some cases, some people are unable to reach them. They, when they approach us, then we contact our missions and on our request, our missions uh, contact them. So, uh, uh, I will now also inform that all this repatriation process, Foreign Office has uh, played its role along with other ministries under the umbrella of NCOC because it's Ministry of Foreign Affairs as well as Overseas Pakistan Division, which makes the uh, schedule of the flights. And the data is provided by CMU to the NCOC so that NCOC can have a decision making. And so uh, we are trying to have as much accurate data as, much, uh, as possible for us. So thank you very much, sir. Uh, I have shed light, tried to shed some light on the contribution of Foreign Office. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Atar. Okay, so our next speaker is Senator Seher Kamran. She is the patron in chief of the Center for Pakistan and Gulf Studies. She has served as the member Senate Standing Committee on Defense, Defense Production, Foreign Affairs, Federal Education, Professional Training, uh, Overseas Pakistanis, Human Resource Development, and Functional Committee on Human Rights. Uh, Senator Kamran. The floor is over to you. Uh, thank you. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, foremost, I would like to felicitate the entire team of Center for Middle East and Africa at the Institute of Strategic Studies for arranging this very timely webinar on COVID-19 and repatriation of Pakistani workers' socioeconomic implications. Since we have limited time, I will commence by sharing some statistics as we are all aware that COVID-19 is an unprecedented threat to the modern civilization. It has caused severe socioeconomic disruptions across the planet and one of the largest predicted recessions in the modern history. The outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic has resulted in disruptions within political, social, economic, religious, and financial structures across the planet indiscriminately. The impact of this pandemic is being felt by all. Both the developed and the developing countries in the world are facing a shrinking economy, a negative growth rate, and an uphill battle with superinflation and unemployment. Prior to the pandemic, Pakistan's economic growth was already at an all-time low. The national economy was facing a severe, severe revenue shortfall, shrinking it to an estimated Pak rupees 42 trillion. According to Pike, it is expected that around 2.4% of the annual GDP may be lost due to COVID-19, bringing the country to a recession. Prior to the pandemic, Pakistan ranked the lowest in the entire South Asia at 153rd space in the Human Development Index. With 60% of the country's population living beneath the poverty line, these figures along with the unemployment statistics are estimated to increase manifold. As per Dr. Naeem Haq, Vice Chancellor of Pai, 19 to 20 million were expected to lose their jobs owing to COVID-19. Whereas the number of people living below the poverty line is estimated to double around 125 million from the existing 50 to 60 million. Dear colleagues, 
it's no secret that Pakistan's fragile economy heavily relies on the foreign remittances. According to the data made available by the Ministry of Finance in 2018-2019, Pakistan received $21 billion worth of remittances, which are roughly equal to country's total export bill. A report by Spide highlighted that remittances sent by Pakistani workers accounted for more than 6% of GDP, Pakistan's GDP in 2019. Its significance for the national economy is highlighted from the fact that remittances make up around 86% of the secondary income balance, helping maintain the country's ever-fluctuating foreign exchange reserves. It's important to note that in the last five years, the remittances from Saudi Arabia range between 4.8 billion and 5.9 billion, and 3.1 billion and 4.3 billion from UAE, by 2.6 million overseas Pakistanis residing in Saudi Arabia and 1.5 million residing in UAE. It was projected that Pakistan would receive around US dollar 23 billion in financial year 2020 and over $26 billion in financial year 2021. However, owing to the COVID-19 outbreak and consequently the shutting down of the global economy, these figures will be significantly revised. As thousands of Pakistani expatriate workings in foreign countries, especially in the Gulf, have been laid off from work and sent back home or are waiting to return. Dear colleagues, I would, it would be premature to esti estimate the exact number of Pakistani workers who have lost jobs uh, and eventually be repatriated from the Gulf countries. According to a statement by the Special Assistant to Prime Minister at overseas, on overseas Pakistanis, over 21,000 Pakistani expatriates in the Gulf states have so far lost their jobs amid the coronavirus pandemic. To be very honest, number is much higher than what has been estimated and quoted. We must also count here for those who may prefer to undergo the difficult time and continue to stay in the host country without any job or on a reduced salary package, which will definitely impact foreign remittances. I have lived in Saudi Arabia for about 20 years and have witnessed a lot of development due to revised domestic Arab and Gulf policies for foreign workers. We must also need to take in consideration that skilled population, education standard, and literacy rate has tremendously increased in the Gulf countries. Today, literacy rate in Saudi Arabia is up 98%. Employment opportunities have been open to young educated Saudi youth especially women, resulting in return of foreign workers to their home countries. However, as per the Ministry of Overseas Pakistanis and Human Resource Development, as of 13 May, at least 24,500 standard Pakistanis have repatriated from various countries under the Special Repatriation Operation. On 8 May, Pakistan's Foreign Office stated that 109,000 Pakistani expatriates, including 60,000 from UAE, around 16,000 in Saudi Arabia and 5,500 in Qatar were awaiting rep rep repatriation. These numbers are indeed distressing and will continue to grow as flights, operation resumes and time passes. But it is fair to assume that the stress on Pakistan's economic resources and the socioeconomic repercussions of the repatriation of these migrant workers will have a significant impact in long run. I will briefly discuss the way forward. The workers who are the Worst hit, especially in the Gulf countries, are the low-income labor who came to the region looking for work to support their families back home financially. Most of them are sole earners of their families and through their remittances have helped them escape poverty. However, that is about to change. The most obvious implication with their mass repatriation will be witnessed in form of a jump in the unemployment rate in the country. According among the many other evils that come with unemployment, the most significant of them is looming threat of hunger crisis. Owing to the shortage of jobs in the already stretched economy, it is feared that number of people living below the poverty line will be doubled, and they will not be able to afford basic amenities of life, especially the food items. The poverty and hunger crisis has the potential to snowball into a precarious law and order situation as people will adapt unlawful means to earn money owing to the non-existence of economic opportunities. However, it is essential that situation should be controlled before such a condition arises. Dear friends, in order to prevent a doomsday scenario, it is pertinent that the government must ensure alternative means and ways to bridge the widening financial gap owing to the sudden drop in foreign remittances. For this purpose, the, step, the first step should be collation of factual data of the repatriated migrants. 
data limitations can prove to be constrained in policy formulation, so that hurdle should be removed. Based on the data, the government should assess the families of such low income workers who can drift below the poverty line without any assistance. Inward economy, domestic production, and self-reliance is one of the viable options. Such projects that could create jobs should be started to help the jobless people. The migrants who want to start their own businesses should be supported so that they can contribute to job creation. Government should reduce the red tape and offer financial incentives such as tax holidays and provide information on investment possibilities. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the need of the hour to understand the gravity of the situation and tackle this sensitive issue with foresight and precision. We as a nation need to work together if we truly want to find a workable solution for a magnitude of problems facing our country. I wish the Center for Middle East and Africa team the best of success in the world and they are doing that they are doing. Thank you. And I would conclude by uh, commending the two young girls who are contributing immensely and they are actively making the center worth of this creation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Amir Sheikh. He has been the managing director of the Overseas Pakistani Foundation since 2018. Uh, Dr. Sheikh has held various management positions in the government uh, of Pakistan, both in the field as well as the secretariat. He was last posted as managing director, Overseas Employment. Uh, Dr. Sheikh, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Amna. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the topic is COVID-19 and repatriation of Pakistani workers, socioeconomic implications. As far as repatriation is concerned, I think Mr. Mohid has shed a lot of light on that. However, just to you know, uh, sum up, the number of stranded overseas Pakistanis increased up to a maximum of 1,10,000. As of now, it is 94,000. And till date, we have repatriated almost 50,000 work workers from abroad. This includes 1,426 14, 14, 14, 14, 1,477 prisoners, and 1,326 Zairis. So this is just a summary of what we have done in terms of repatriation. The process, I think, has already been explained by Dr. Mohit Yusuf. Now, let's come to the remittance part. Till date, we haven't got the hit as such. Last year, the overall remittances were around 22 billion. And up till, up till you know, uh, April, we don't see a major hit as of now. In fact, in January, February, March, and April, there was an increase of five, six, seven percent. Plus, uh, even in April, uh, we didn't get a proper, a real hit in terms of you know reduction in uh, the remittances. Now, if we were to look at the reasons as to why we haven't got the hit in terms of remittance as yet, basically, anybody who was coming back to Pakistan or who was laid off or who was who was proceeding on unpaid or paid uh, leave by the employer, they were kind of, you know, sending whatever their savings were to Pakistan. Say, for example, 50,000 people who have been repatriated till date, they also, you know, kind of remitted whatever their savings were. Hence, we can easily see that there is no uh, hit as such in terms of, uh, you know, the uh, remittances. However, what happens in future? Well, there is an expectation that obviously there might be some decrease in the remittances, but then there are too many factors dependent uh, on which it would be dependent, like how many people are laid off, how many people out of them you know get reemployed there or after coming back again are re-exported, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The important thing is. As of now, the export of manpower has come to a halt. So if we were expecting that last year we had a $22 billion remittance annual, we were expecting that you know it may increase by at least 10% this year, which would have meant you know 24 billion around. So the increase may not be there, but we may be able to achieve at least that much or 
you know, fall a little short of the target uh, of, of 22 billion as such. As regards, you know, uh, the numbers we have already discussed, well, what has been the role of OPF in, the, uh, uh, in this whole repatriation process? Well, on 20th of March, when the airspace was closed, there were around two to 3,000 people who were stranded at the airports. So the first thing that OPF or Ministry of Overseas Pakistanis did was to establish an emergency cell or an emergency helpline in OPF. It had five hunting landline numbers and five WhatsApp and mobile numbers. So people could easily reach us and we could accordingly, you know, communicate back to our missions or to the National Crisis Management Unit in MOFA and, and at the same time, you know, reach out to the people as such so that they, they, they had a feeling that they, can, they are being heard. Furthermore, once, you know, this crisis management cell was established, then the National Command and Operations Center started working and the ministry and the OPF got represented in the Aviation Committee of the National Command and Operations Center and we kept on raising the voice of overseas Pakistanis in these meetings. In addition, OPF has established the Overseas Pakistanis Facilitation Desks at the airports, which were further augmented in order to you know, support the people who are coming back, stranded, the stranded overseas Pakistanis who are coming back. Furthermore, we uh, provided the ambulance service uh, to the dead bodies that were transported. There were around 342 dead bodies that have been transported to Pakistan since 20th of March. Uh, in addition, Overseas Pakistani Foundation provided rupees 20 million to NDMA as a grant, as a, uh, as a donation for providing food to the students who were stranded in the Wuhan city because they were unable to get the Pakistani food, etc. Similarly, there were other steps that OPF took uh, in this time of crisis. We have already started, you know, getting the uh, complaints for recovery of dues from the employer. People who have left the job have partly, you know, missed the dues, some of them, and we have already taken them up with, through our missions, our CWAs, with the employer, and till date, OPF has, the amount, total amount recovered from the employer and, you know, disbursed to the workers since, you know, the inception of OPF is rupees 4 billion. So we'll keep on doing this because, you know, the more the people are laid off, the more is the repatriation, the greater will be the demand for recovery of dues from the employers abroad. In addition, we are providing the financial assistance to anybody who got disabled, that is rupees 3 lakhs, and who, you know, uh, passed away, we, we, are, we are giving a grant of rupees 4, four lakhs. Furthermore, we have a chain of schools and colleges across the length and breadth of Pakistan and as of now, we have 25 colleges and schools. In these schools, those people who are coming back, those workers, they are most welcome in terms of admission and we'll grant 50% tuition fee off to, these, uh, to, the, to the children of these workers, plus the first right of admission because when they're coming back, the problem is that, you know, uh, uh, they're coming in middle of the session and most of the schools would not be taking them up because the sessions would be full. We'll uh, try our level best to accommodate each and every one of them. In addition, our housing projects are there. Till date, Overseas Pakistanis Foundation has launched around 10 projects in which 10,000 plots have been, you know, uh, allotted to the Overseas Pakistanis. We are, we have recently launched the uh, country homes and apartments in zone 5 of Islamabad. The overseas Pakistanis are coming back and are in, uh, in search of, you know, uh, immediate uh, uh, property buying, etc. They're most welcome to, you know, tap this resource of ours. Furthermore, I mean, uh, our online complaint management cell is active. Anybody who has any complaint anywhere can complain us online. We take it up with our missions abroad and with the employer as such. Uh, that is the, that that is all that I have to say as of now. However, in terms of facilitation and reintegration, 
uh, DG Bureau has already shed some light. I can add to that. We are coming up with a project with the uh, with GIZ, the German uh, development agency here in Pakistan. Uh, they are uh, giving us a grant of 3.16 million euros, which is around 60 to 65 crore rupees. From this, you know, what we are doing is anybody who's coming back, would, if he wants to, you know, step, uh, you know, get his skill upgradation, we can, you know, get him trained free of cost with NevTech. Uh, furthermore, if he's interested to secure some micro loans for developing, uh, for establishing a micro enterprise, we can even, you know, get into that. Uh, uh, furthermore, all the feasibilities that he requires for, uh, you know, setting up a micro enterprise, we will be coordinating with SMEDA and, you know, with the gentleman who, who requires this. In addition, the people who are coming back, data voice would be maintained and uh, the Bureau of Immigration and Overseas em and uh, the Bureau of Immigration and Overseas Employment plus the Overseas Employment Corporation, they will you know kind of try to re-export them wherever the uh, the just the supply and demand matches wherever the demand comes from the employer they'll place their CVs as well and if the employer selects them they can be you know uh, employed abroad once again which is like re-export of manpower. But then, as of now, you know, since the flight operation, especially to GCC, is uh, you know not on, so therefore, uh, uh, you know, this re-export of manpower is still, you know, in terms of the database only. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sheikh. Um, our final speaker for today's event is Ambassador Asif Durrani, who is a seasoned diplomat. Um, who has served in various diplomatic assignments, uh, to name a few in New Delhi, New York, Kabul, London, Tehran, and as the di uh, Director General mentioned, the UAE. Uh, Ambassador Durrani, the floor is yours. Please unmute yourself. Thank you, Amna. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Thank you so much for this initiative. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Khalid Mahmood, Ambassador Azaz Chaudhary, for uh, guiding uh, the Institute of Strategic Studies and uh, taking up uh, issues uh, which are actually should be discussed by everyone and uh, in order to cre create awareness among the people. Uh, my, the, the previous speakers have already spoken about the statistics, I will not go into those details. Uh, uh, for me, the important thing is what are the lessons we have learned? And uh, let's be realistic. My first uh, lesson learned would be that uh, overall uh, in the global uh, scale, uh, it is said that the economies are going to shrink uh, from seven to 8% of the GDPs. So it's a, it's a humongous number. So we have to cater into that. When we talk about our uh, ex uh, expatriates, uh, workers abroad, especially in the Middle East, and that too in the Gulf states, if we further uh, focus on that, so it's close to 4.5 million. In that respect, uh, the Gulf economies are also likely to be affected almost 10%. And the layers of uh, which are projected uh, uh, there are close to 10 to 15 percent. In that respect, if we have around 4.5 million uh, Pakistanis abroad, so roughly we'll have around 400 to 500,000 laborers which will be laid off, uh, most particularly uh, the unskilled workers. So therefore, the government will have to uh, cater for uh, those eventualities and, uh, and their uh, uh, rehabilitation once they return back to the country. Second is that uh, we have to revisit our priorities, national priorities. I would emphasize that we have to educate our people. Our literacy rate is ab abysmally low. In this day and age, 60% literacy rate is just nothing. We have to raise it and in any case, we have to focus it because education is the only thing. If, I'm asked to uh, what to do and how to uh, 
bring about uh, progress in the country, I'll say educate, educate, educate your people. There's no shortcut to it. And with education also, you'll have health awareness and you will improve your health conditions. So I think this is the lesson learned with this COVID-19 that we have to focus on health and education. And the third thing would be in this particular case, when we are talking about repatriation of our workers, would be that we have to reach out to our community and community leaders because our community has done a tremendous job. Uh, we have talked about their remittances uh, close to $22 billion uh, last year and uh, our project this year also. Uh, the, these remittances apart, those uh, Pakistani uh, expatriates have done very well, were well settled, and I think we have to reach out to them in order to create some kind of awareness among our unskilled workers as well as those who are skilled and perhaps have to be laid off or they have to uh, work on reduced uh, salaries. So I think uh, let's uh, begin and then uh, our embassies should uh, make uh, their efforts uh, in order to bring those community leaders together and chalk out strategies that how minimum uh, uh, that damage could be done with the way their, uh, their uh, unemployments. And my last uh, uh, recommendation would be uh, that uh, construction sector has already been opened in Pakistan. And I think the construction sector is the sector which actually gives employment to uh, unskilled as well as skilled workers and that makes the bulk of it. So in order to control uh, uh, poverty or uh, uh, the graph slipping down, um, we have to focus on construction. And I think the government will have to spend in the construction industry and they have to launch projects. And I think that's how we can, I think, overcome to a greater extent uh, in mitigating uh, the effects of uh, unemployment, uh, which are likely to visit this country. I thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Durrani. I think all the speakers have made some very important uh, points, and I think they'll go a long okay. way in helping uh, talk out to, to deal with this, this pandemic and its effects. Um, we're going to have um, an interactive session now, and the floor is open for questions. Um, I believe Ambassador Chaudhary uh, had a question. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Amina, and thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, useful discussion. Um, you know, we have had many sessions on different events and in different themes, but I get, on this, I get a sense that uh, despite the enormity of the challenge, all the uh, stakeholders, all the actors involved are in sync and harmony. So this is quite encouraging for me. Uh, I see that uh, uh, people are working with zeal and people are talking to each other, which is which is something uh, very encouraging. Uh, we have done a session on the uh, on the impact of COVID on economy. And uh, everyone realizes that the remittances would also be affected uh, by that. Uh, and we also, uh, I'm also encouraged uh, by the efforts that uh, uh, OPF has made, I must say, uh, to get the dues of the, um, of the workers back from their employers. Uh, something which is which is also uh, encouraging. Um, there was one proposal that somebody gave in one of those sessions was to contact the governments of the Gulf countries at a higher level and uh, and stagger the layoffs. Um, as we have seen that there are laws passed in Saudi Arabia and laws passed in the United Arab Emirates where their own citizens would be maintained while outsiders would be let go. Saudis have given some consideration to Pakistanis. So uh, I don't know whether that kind of contact is happening uh, uh, to stagger because we cannot absorb so many people coming back 
which will have an impact on remittances which have an impact here in pakistan itself so uh, i don't know who can answer that question um, but uh, this comes to my mind that we need to uh, so kashif and noor maybe would could take that question that if if they can slow down the layoffs for pakistanis um, uh, that might help us yes kashif Uh, thank you sir yes uh, since this covid uh, break out we have had a two pronged strategy one of missions or community welfare attaches they were issued formal directions by the ministry upon our request that they should contact the employers the host governments as well as the workers to delay the layoffs if they cannot stop the layoffs at least they should be delayed we've been trying to uh, talk to workers as well through our overseas employment promoters or community welfare attaches mdopf myself <coughs> to convince them to take a bit of a hit in salary but don't opt for a layoff or don't quit your job because if you come back Uh, it may not be uh, possible for all of us to get you a good job a decent job straight away so this is one part of the strategy the second part is our uh, sapm say azul fakar abbas bukhari has been in constant contact with the labor ministers of the gcc countries especially in fact we've been having online meetings with them on a weekly basis attended again by myself and the ndopf and we have been constantly raising this point uh, in a way that if the layoff has to happen the worker who comes back should be paid his dues as well as the return ticket back home still our first priority is to convince the worker as well as the management and the uh, host government that layoff is not a solution for them as well as for us and the workers all three parties it's not a solution and uh, alhamdulillah because of those efforts i think that layoffs as far as pakistani workers are concerned have been much less than indians and bangladeshis so far um i have noted with concern the figures which uh, ambassador durani has shared and inshallah we'll try that 10 to 15% layoff of pakistani workers should not happen inshallah inshallah under any circumstances and uh, we'll keep on seeking guidance from him as well as from uh, issi and i would request uh, my esteemed colleagues who are sitting in issi to please keep sharing and guiding us because uh, what you go uh, go through and check and the academia and the uh, think tax we in field sometimes miss on the finer details which you guys keep an eye on i'm uh, obliged for that intervention by ambassador durani thank you sir thank you um i'm uh, sorry senator kamran i believe you yeah. have a question yeah yeah uh, if i'm unmuted yes okay. you can hear okay okay i would say that we should understand the categories of the immigrants uh, and uh, overseas pakistani workers they are legal immigrants not yet filed but not getting any salary they are legal immigrants having no job they are illegal immigrants either in jail or in hiding so uh, we have to understand that their needs and their situation uh, legal immigrants not yet filed but not getting any salary majority of the white collar jobs employed in reputed industries and offices are not yet laid but maybe their salaries have been reduced i know this like exactly because my husband is working in saudi arabia so i have been talking to him on the daily basis and what i have learned that exactly in saudi uh, in saudi arabia people used used to get an extra salary or a bonus um, mr khalid mahmood is here he has been ambassador in saudi arabia and i think he has the most of the experience uh, so they were getting an extra salary this was not paid this year There, there is a 40% reduction in the salaries, which is also impacting on their house rent and reduction in the basic salary, which is impacting total allowances. And the, especially those people who are living with their families, it is very difficult for them to sustain. 
and this category definitely need favorable policies from the host government and the government of Pakistan should ensure that they are not laid off and their ikamas are extended. There should be some incentives like maybe their ikama fee is waived off or they may get some incentive. At this level, I believe that we should engage all the host countries. Then there are legal immigrants having no jobs. The immigrants having legal status, but due to current situation, small businesses have closed, especially those who are working in the private companies. No one can like you know control that because companies look at their profit, they look at their business, and if there is no income, there are no revenue, or there are revenue shortage, they will definitely lay off their workers, and some of those will never like to come back. But how would they sustain? So due to meager resources, their savings can't last long, and they need evacuation by the government resources at the earliest. Remittances from such workers have seen decline, and we may see major influx of Pakistani immigrants from the region because of this. Then there are illegal immigrants, and either in jail or in hiding, like those who go on the open visa and they are like you know trapped by the travel agents, and they are really in in the serious problem because uh, they are illegal, they are hiding because fearing the harsh punishment by the host government. And if the pandemic prolongs, then remittances from these segments of workers would completely dry up and their survival will also be, you know, uh, very difficult in the host countries. So negotiations have to start it with the host government for their safe return. Especially, the, there has to be some incentives, uh, some uh, offers, some uh, relaxation for the illegal workers who have no job, who cannot survive. So here, the Pakistani government should take an initiative to uh, reduce their miseries and help them come back. So this is very important that we understand that what type of workers are there. And let me tell you that people who have their families there, it is very difficult for them to survive. Most of the people are employed in the private companies. The government can only ask the public sector and the government sector to retain the workers, but they will also look at their own preferences because all the good jobs have gone uh, due to their local policies, Saudiization, or preferences of the local uh, uh, population in the other countries, uh, there has been a shrinking place for Pakistani workers. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have a question? Yes, madam, should I take this? Uh, Kashif, I think, Mr. Kashif. Kashif. Okay, would Mr. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sure. Uh, uh, very correctly pointed out, Honorable Senator Saiba, yes. The issues are there. Uh, I'll try to address all your concerns one by one, G. As far as the renewal of ikamas and the ikama fees were concerned, we've been talking to the governments uh, to get them extended and preferably free of costs. Some governments have obliged and some are obliging. Inshallah, uh, till end of 2020, most of the ikamas would be extended free of cost. In particular, we have raised this issue with UAE and Saudi Arabia because uh, in both those countries, most of our uh, workers, as well as white collar, blue collar, all are there. Yes, madam, you are correct. Both, all the GCC countries have issued decrees, more so in our, in our case, Saudi Arabia and UAE. And you are very, uh, very rightly pointed out, the bonuses are not there. Right now, uh, it's a matter of survival, G. Uh, we are trying to convince our workers as well as the management to go for a reduced working hours. If you had gone through the decree of the Saudi government, they are calling for a renewed contract, wherein the uh, pro rata working hours would be reduced as the salary would be reduced up to 40%. It is not necessary that it will be 40. It will be up to 40%. G. But they are calling for a renewed contract between the worker and the employer and they want government of pakistan to help them in negotiating it with the workers and we are trying to convince the workers that having a slight hit would be better than coming back home and uh, being jobless you are again very right jeep azad visa as they call in saudi arabia has taken the greatest hit because of the lockdown situations the workers or the people who had gone uh, for a kafil and then they were working on a Azad visa and paying a retainership to the kafil, they were hit because of the small businesses being shut down. Uh, things have slightly improved and uh, are opening up. And inshallah, inshallah, we hope that uh, those workers would 
start getting some jobs and some work. But you are very right; they have taken the highest hit, and so have the visit visa guys who went to UAE. They go on a visit visa, they search a job. Once they get a job, and then they get into uh, that job and get their account made and stuff like that. And the guy, especially who went in uh, three or four months in uh, preceding to Corona, have had the biggest hit. This is what the numbers registered in the embassy show you. As far as the Gulfization is concerned, this is based on uh, in all these six countries on the basis of that McKinsey study of 2015, wherein they have, all of them have adopted policies to reduce overseas. Uh, incoming uh, migrant workers to put more reliance on their own uh, countrymen and country women and you see different uh, i mean steps taken by all the countries especially saudi arabia they started reducing the trades in which foreign workers could come in it's not so only for pakistan it's for all the manpower exporting countries to them and then they allowed their women to drive Drivers to Saudi Arabia was one of our biggest categories. And uh, since they have allowed their women to drive, the employment in that category has reduced considerably. But again, since it's a host country policy and it's uniform for all, so we can't challenge it. We've been trying to negotiate and convince them that if somebody gets unemployed, he or she uh, should be able to find an alternate job within that country. Uh, UAE and Saudi Arabia both have shared their platforms with us and we are encouraging our workers that if you get unemployed from one job, please register yourself because uh, their governments have committed to readjust them and to allow uh, future hiring uh, for other companies only once they get an sort of an NOC from that platform. So in this way, a worker which is already there stands, um, I mean, uh, less chances of getting unemployed, laid off, and sent back. So this is what we are working on with those uh, countries. I hope, Madam, I've answered all your uh, concerns. Thank you. Uh, I just would like to add briefly that with the reduced who are living their families, they are unable to meet their day-to-day -day expenses. They are unable to, because they are not reduced, those who have already made the contracts with their house uh, landowner. Uh, they are not ready to revise that, their edu children's education, their survival, because we have to understand that COVID-19 has impacted on the global economy. It's not only Pakistan. So they also have their own genuine issues. This time, Umrah was stopped. So, you know, we have to see that there was revenue, their revenue share shortfall also. The oil prices were down, so we have to see that exactly what is the realistic situation there. But I'm I'm not exactly asking question. I was just adding the comments to the situation, so we could address those. This, these are my comments. These were this was not my question. I was just adding the, to the, to the debate that we have to also keep this in consideration. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Um, Ambassador hey, Chaudhary, you you have a comment to make. All right. So um, if we have no more uh, questions, then um, I would now like to um, invite Ambassador Khalid Mahmood, um, who is the chairman, board of governors, ISSI, and a former ambassador of Pakistan to Iran, Iraq, China, Saudi Arabia, as well as Mongolia, for his closing remarks. Um, <coughs> ambassador Khalid Mahmood. Uh, thank you. <coughs> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. See, the theme of the today's webinar, repatriation of Pakistanis and uh, social, their social and economic implications is uh, a very uh, timely issue uh, which requires urgent attention. Now, special assistant to the Prime Minister, Mr. Muhyid Yusuf, and uh, other speakers preceding me, uh, Senator uh, Sir Kamran, and the Director General of uh, Overseas uh, Immigration, 
I'm Lester Asir Durani, and uh, Director General of OPF, as well as representatives of the Foreign Ministry. You see, all have uh, touched on uh, uh, various angles of uh, this issue uh, from uh, their, uh, you know, viewpoint. But one thing is clear, that these uh, Pakistanis who are working abroad, they were great assets for Pakistan. Uh, not only that they brought some, were well, a major source of uh, uh, remittances, uh, but also that uh, they were uh, helping friendly countries in their uh, drive for modernization, for industrialization. And uh, uh, these uh, workers, uh, Pakistanis uh, were, you know, creating, I mean, they were undergoing great, uh, sometimes stress, uh, because they had left their families behind, and they were eking out uh, subsistence for themselves and for those uh, left behind. Uh, see, Things were changing already, as I said. That uh, uh, process of indigenization in these countries had already started. And with the result that uh, the skilled Pakistanis abroad, doctors, engineers, you know, uh, and uh, educationists, they had uh, started migrating to United States or Canada. The majority of those left behind were unskilled. And uh, uh, they were already under stress. And as I explained to us you know, earlier, that, that they have started coming back to Pakistan. Uh, secondly, the, the nature of work in these countries had also changed. Uh, now it was no longer we needed unskilled labor there, but uh, people who were skilled, you know, in various uh, professions. Unfortunately, majority of Pakistanis uh, uh, expatriate community consisted of uh, uh, these unskilled laborers, and for them, the demand was already diminishing. So we were, uh, you know, facing this problem, uh, and then comes uh, this. Uh, uh, decline or steep decline in the oil prices and uh, also this COVID-19. Now this compounded the, the predicament of the, these workers as well as the, of the host government. Now it has been very uh, you know, explained in detail what was the response of the government of Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan took its responsibilities very seriously and naturally it uh, first focused on the immediate requirement of uh, uh, repatriating, uh, bringing those uh, Pakistanis abroad who were now stranded, who have lost their jobs, uh, whose, job, whose salaries had been reduced and so on. You know. So in that, uh, Pakistan adopted a very flexible policy, keeping in view the uh, uh, exigencies of the pandemic, uh, as well as uh, the constraints of uh, Pakistan's uh, economy. Uh, but the fact remains that uh, uh, by its very nature, the process had to be like this. It could not be, have been a very perfect, flawless operation. Uh, government uh, did what it was possible and kept on uh, you know, tuning their response to the changing uh, uh, situations. Uh, so I think uh, this uh, process is still continuing of bringing Pakistan is back. But equally important is uh, the fate of those who return. 
and that I am talking of the in, uh, reintegration or integration in the Pakistani uh, economy. So already many uh, useful suggestions uh, have been made uh, uh, in that uh, regard. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think one should uh, uh, think, uh, apart from the construction sector, which has been opened up uh, and would provide uh, uh, good opportunities for the absorption of these uh, returnees, uh, I think one should also think uh, how to absorb them in this uh, mega projects of the CPEC, the Special Economic Zone. I think we have to look into that because they are also opening up new there we would need both skilled and unskilled, you know, uh, labor. So this could be another uh, avenue to explore. Uh, and then, uh, of course, as the wheels of industry and agriculture start moving, uh, that is the, uh, also uh, uh, possibilities there. But one important aspect which was touched upon was the claims of these uh, uh, the workers returning from abroad. Even during the best of times, uh, this was the problem in these countries, that uh, uh, claims which uh, uh, the workers had uh, with their employers, it was easier to settle with the uh, government, public you know, employers. But with the private employers, this, in, the, in the normal time, this was a problem. Now, this must have got aggravated. But I was very happy to learn that uh, uh, the and Bureau has been able to uh, set, help settle many of these, uh, a majority of these cases. But I think there will be still uh, uh, a, quite a big uh, backlog uh, and we need to uh, pro keep providing legal assistance uh, to these uh, uh, workers whose uh, claims uh, remain uh, unsettled, uh, provide this assistance to the embassies and uh, um, and lastly, uh, I would uh, not forget the illegal immigrants. So legal immigrants, we have all discussed. It, but illegal immigrants, they are squeezed from all sides. You know, they are really the unfortunate uh, lot, and uh, they, we should not forget. You know how to look after them. After all, they are also Pakistanis. And uh, we have to pay special attention for their uh, welfare also. So to conclude, I would say that uh, uh, the government through its various agencies, through the embassies, uh, have done the best possible under the circumstances. But the uh, effort uh, has to continue because the job is not over. And uh, uh, Come the first part, the immediate part, you know, uh, of bringing the people back. But I think more arduous job is to how to integrate them gainfully uh, in their normal social life. And I think focus should uh, turn to that aspect as urgently as possible. So thank you, all of you, and I particularly recommend uh, this uh, uh, Institute of Strategic. Uh, Studies uh, Center on Middle East and uh, Africa uh, that uh, it has uh, shown light on a very important subject uh, of national importance. And all uh, commendation also to its Director General as asked Chaudhary. Thank you very much to all the participants. Thank you. 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 Um, I would once again like to reiterate um, and express my gratitude to our speakers, Dr. Yuna, sorry, Dr. Yusuf, Senator Kamran, Mr. Noor, Mr. Atar, and Ambassador Zarani for their insights and to all the participants who took part. Uh, thank you and uh, good afternoon. Asalaamu Alaikum. <laughs>